Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, is Dr. Maber, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Awesome. Well, thank you for, first of all, thank you for doing this. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's good to actually finally get to talk to you for the first time. I've, I've sort of followed some of your stuff for, for a number of years now. And so, um, are you still in, in New Mexico? No, I actually, uh, uh, two and a half years ago, I moved to Texas to take an academic job as a, a professor, uh, teaching family medicine residents in a, in a, 24 resident residency program. Where is that, where is that at? It's at uh, Denison, Texas. It's the Texoma Family Medicine Residency based in the Texoma okay. uh, Medical Center there, a, a 500 bed hospital. Okay, very good. Okay, because I, I lived in, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but I practiced in Rio Rancho, I lived in Corrales. Yeah, um, I, I loved Rio Rancho when I lived there. It was, it was it's a yeah, great- it's far from I wish I could have found an academic. I wish I could have found an academic job in uh, Rio Rancho or even in New Mexico. I definitely would have stayed there. Interesting, interesting. Well, well, first of all, um, if you don't mind, just can you introduce yourself? Obviously, you know you, you're an MD practicing family medicine. Can you give us a little maybe maybe background on you? I mean, you kind of came to a interesting dietary conclusion like I did, but let's let's hear your background if you don't mind. No, I'd love to tell you. Uh, um, I practiced medicine for 30 years and I half the time in the civilian community and half the time in the military. And I battled my weight basically since I was in elementary school because I uh, was raised in a sugar eating environment and was addicted to sugar sweetened beverages, candies of all kinds, desserts of all kinds. And uh, basically, ate a very high carbohydrate diet. So I was always obese or overweight. And I would try to get out and uh, jog 30, 40, even 50 miles a week uh, to try to get my weight down. And uh, it, as the, the years progressed, it became harder and harder to get my weight down doing that. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, when I was oh, uh, 63 years old, uh, and about ready to retire from the military, I discovered uh, basically low carb, low carbohydrate diets, and uh, managed to lose a bunch of the weight uh, with little effort and without all that jogging. And then uh, I discovered the zero carb community, and the zero carb community is uh, are carnivores that eat meat, eggs, cheese, and butter only. So they do have some dairy in their diet and. I was on the zero carb diet uh, more or less uh, for about eight years uh, and got my weight down to, you know, ideal weight for me, I thought, and uh, with, with no effort. So uh, at, when I retired from the military a year after I began low carb, I decided to take a sabbatical since I have a very healthy military pension plus social security and I didn't need to work. So I started researching and doing literature researches and I got interested in the academic side of medicine. So after about five years of research, uh, I had thousands of articles collated and I did the uh, 300 hours of CME and uh, uh, a uh, supervised preceptorship to get my Texas license activated and came back into active practice as a uh, uh, core faculty at a family medicine residency, teaching the residents and also seeing my own patients um, in clinic, uh, in my own continuity clinic. So uh, I now have almost three years of, you know, actively using low carbohydrate diets in clinical practice. And uh, to help my patients, I uh, designed a um, web-based uh, educational program to teach people how to do a low carbohydrate diet. It's a, it can be found on the web at www.u-turn.us. That's u-turn.us. And I'm sure they'll put that in the show notes at some point. But um, in that, my introductory video on that page, I tell people, one, that there are no essential plant foods that need to be eaten to be healthy, and that I uh, 
I tell them that uh, the carnivore option is a very viable option because in my own experience, what I've found is that it's addiction to sugar and highly processed carbohydrate foods uh, that is the stumbling block to help uh, people with uh, metabolic diseases. And if you go on my website, barntoeatmeat.com, okay, and I'm sure they'll put that in the show notes also, uh, you'll see that I've listed uh, 39 conditions that are um, associated with insulin resistance. Now, uh, insulin resistance uh, is something that comes on slowly, and it's caused by eating too much sugar or drinking too much ethanol because both uh, fructose, which is half of every sugar molecule, table sugar molecule, or, uh, and ethanol are processed through the same pathways in the liver, and 80% of the calories from those things wind up as fat in the liver and fat in the pancreas, and that causes um, uh, insulin resistance where uh, the insulin stops working, and there are, there are other processes. The insulin resistance is a little more complicated than that, but uh, we don't have time to get into all that right now, but that's the basic cause. And once you're insulin resistant, you can't tolerate carbohydrates in your diet any longer. And you'll just, you're just going to get fat and, you know, everybody has a personal fat threshold. So 10% of all diabetics uh, have a normal body mass index, but, uh, and they can't put on that fat. So that fat just builds up in the internal organs and that's, you know, skinny fat or, uh, and that's even worse because that uh, makes the insulin resistance worse and the high insulin levels and high sugar levels do the damage. Okay, so the, I'll just briefly maybe read the 39 conditions listed on my website that are associated with having high insulin levels and high sugar levels. And, and that's cancer, blindness, stroke, heart disease, heart failure, peripheral artery disease, gout, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, osteoarthritis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, amputations, kidney failure, sleep apnea, hearing loss, psoriasis, low sperm count, low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, fibroid tumors, uh, enlarged prostate, glaucoma, early onset sexual maturity in children, uh, clots, especially deep venous thrombosis and uh, pulmonary embolisms, gallstones, sarcoidosis, carpal tunnel syndrome, Barrett's esophagitis and esophageal cancer, multiple myeloma, acid indigestion, post-surgical complications, which I know uh, Dr. Baker is well familiar with, uh, overactive adrenal glands, alopecia areata, demodex folliculorum, which is a uh, insect infestation of the skin in humans, uh, kidney stones, cognitive impairment in schizophrenic patients, uh, and fibrocystic breast disease. And on my website, you'll find links to the scholarly articles that implicate uh, the metabolic syndrome in all those conditions. And uh, so, um, um, I'm sorry, my, my buzzer just went off. I'm just ignoring it. Uh, so um, my, I, can, I call myself uh, uh, a knight errant in the battle against diabetes. Uh, and I, I think that carnivore is going to play a major role in that in our country. And it's costing us trillions of dollars to treat all these conditions that are related to uh, the, the condition of insulin resistance that progresses slowly from having the metabolic syndrome to having prediabetes to having diabetes. And the way I measure that in my clinic is with something called the HOMA IR, or the homostatic, homostatic model assessment where we draw a fasting glucose level and a fasting insulin level, and we, um, um, and we calculate how insulin resistant they are. It's a very elegant and accurate way of um, measuring how far a person is along this uh, continuum from being uh, non-insulin resistant to be, being full diabetic. And so uh, that's, what, that's what I'm doing. And 
I'm hoping uh, in the future, right now, I'm working on a scholarly article that I hope to publish in a major peer reviewed journal on the exact mechanisms of how high insulin levels cause these various conditions. And I'm also, uh, I hope, hope in the next few years to write a textbook on uh, keto ketogenic medicine in primary care that uh, doctors and nurse practitioners can use when they treat people using low carbohydrate diets like a carnivore diet. And I, I definitely plan to address the carnivore diet and it's uh, in that textbook. So that's who I am, what I'm doing, and I'm just happy to be here with some fellow uh, uh, carnivores. I, I'm, I'm still at least 90 plus percent carnivore. I do like to have some uh, uh, sauteed onions and peppers with my steak. And uh, I, I occasionally uh, put a little salsa when I make in my chili when I make it. But uh, other than that, I'm, I don't eat very much in the way of plant materials at all. Yeah, Dr. Man, that's a that's a great introduction. And, you know, the 39 conditions you listed, I, I think there's even more than that that are probably, you know, because there's so many medical conditions. You're probably aware of uh, Professor Grant Schofield in New Zealand, and he wrote a pretty uh, nice paper talking about kind of how hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance underpins so many diseases. And so I'm sure you, you're familiar with his work. Um, let me ask you, you know, you know, in the beginning you stated that, you know, I was, you know, running 40, 50 miles a week and I could never really shed the weight. Why do, why do you think that dropping carbohydrates makes that easy? Now, the critics will say, you know, it's just you didn't eat as many calories and therefore you did that and whatever the mechanism is. I don't really, at the end of the day, I don't really care. I'm just, I'm, I'm just care about the, what the results ultimately are. But why do you feel that for you and, and many, many other people, they find that going low carb or keto or carnivore is just so much easier for them to, to, to drop away? What's, what's going on physiologically in your, in your view? Well, the, 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 the long answer uh, is if you go to my YouTube channel, which is just Paul Mabry, and you can find me quite easily, I probably... I can send you a link in the show notes to it, but um, the, uh, uh, the short answer is that exercise is not a real good way to lose weight. And uh, basically uh, it just increases the appetite. And so people are just hungrier and it doesn't, it does, it's very good for many things. It's good for the brain, it's good for the heart. It's good for your concentration. There's all kinds of reasons that everybody should exercise and I exercise regularly, okay? So I did a, a speech for my residents in which I uh, reviewed every major uh, weight loss study that's been done in the last century. And, uh, and I showed that in, in one section of it, I show all the, the uh, trials of using exercise for weight loss including one where they trained out of shape people to run a marathon and the women actually gained weight in that study. They, they ran a marathon at the end of it. But uh, the, uh, you can view that, that lecture that I gave to my residents where I review all these weight loss studies at, uh, in my YouTube channel at, it's called Obesity the Lecture. And you probably could find it that way by searching Obesity the Lecture. Uh, but uh, I'm a big fan, and I don't know if you've ever uh, interviewed him or talked to him or heard his speeches, but uh, of Doug McGuff. And Doug McGuff, MD, he, he's an emergency room physician that also has run a, a gym for 35 years where they train people uh, using uh, just uh, 15 or 20 minutes of exercise once a week. And he wrote a book called Body by Science, where he shows that the secret uh, to using exercise to, to uh, lose weight and to fight insulin resistance is to exercise the muscles to exhaustion over 60 to 90 seconds. And it's fairly complicated, the science behind it, but there are basically four types of muscle and the strongest uh, 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 fast twitch fibers uh, that we only use when we're totally all the other fibers, the first three levels of fibers have been exhausted. Uh, and they're the ones that use almost exclusively glycogen. So to get rid of the glycogen, 
in our muscles so that the muscles become insulin sensitive again, we have to trip those, uh, those maximum effort fast, uh, fast twitch muscles. And you can only do that when you exercise the muscle to exhaustion. And so that's what I do is once a week I go and I, I do five weightlifting exercises uh, and I have a, uh, an MP3 that counts down to 90 seconds. And when I can, uh, when I, I'm not fully exhausted the muscle by 90 seconds, uh, then I, uh, I increase the weight usually by five pounds. So that's the way I do it. And uh, of course, uh, the science behind it, all the studies are cited in Dr. McGuff's books, Body by Science. So I highly commend that to anybody who wants to exercise. Yeah, I'm familiar with Doug McGuff's work and that, and you know, like I said, I've been gosh, training, strength training for all my entire adult life. I'm, I'm about to turn 55, and I've been doing it for 42 years now, so I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that. And, and you know, this is what the uh, guys like Stu Phillips and some of these protein synthesis and muscle re researchers find that, you know, when you talk to them, the, the biggest stimulus for, uh, you know, muscle retention is training. I mean, there's, there, I mean, protein, you know, you, you need some of that in your diet, but it's not, you know, the, the, the biggest impact you're going to have on that is going to be training. And, and the, just like you mentioned, pushing the muscle to fatigue, to full fatigue, you know, I mean, to failure or near failure is, is what you want to do. Now, some exercises don't lend themselves to failure. You don't want to put a barbell squat on your back and go to failure because you're going you end up getting hurt. But I mean, there's machines that allow you to do that and there's different things that do that. So that's a, that is an important point. I think, you know, the, the, the value of exercise is not so much, can I lose 20 pounds, but can I get stronger? Can I improve my cardiovascular conditioning and, you know, and, and all the other things that it helps. I mean, it's, you know, the muscle is not just, you know, moving your biceps. It has a lot of metabolic uh, impact on the body as well as we're, we're learning. So when you're now, let me ask you, so now you're, you're in an academic setting. Um, I would imagine that what you're talking about is not, well, I mean, many physicians, as you know, don't know anything about nutrition. I mean, the only time they, they yes. learn about nutrition is, is this, you know, if it impacts their health and they care to take, take a look at it. But I mean, most of them either don't know anything about nutrition or don't know how to apply it towards medical conditions, which, you know, unfortunately, uh, I think most of our chronic diseases are highly impacted by nutrition. So how, do, how does that work there? I mean, are you, are you under any sort of scrutiny or do they think you're just this crazy, crazy guy that's out here, you know, promoting, you know, low carb diets and, and, and God forbid eating meat and, and that type of stuff. How's that, how's that received there? I mean, I think in, in the middle of Texas, on the Texas, Oklahoma border, you got to have some people around that, that are pro meat, you know, I mean, that part of the country for sure. Well, you know, um, I have to be very careful in what I say. And uh, I have prepared basically review articles to support all the things I'm telling them. Uh, little, little things, uh, little one pagers with lots of cite, cites, citations for lots of articles. So one, everything I tell them, I give them evidence. So we're supposed to base, to practice evidence-based medicine, but what I find most of my colleagues practicing is what I'd like to call um, uh, expert opinion medicine. Okay, so they, they take the expert opinion of uh, the uh, FDA advisory panel and they say that's gospel. And we, we all know that that's very flawed science, okay? And, and not in any way uh, totally evidence-based. In fact, they've excluded any evidence pretty much that could support low carbohydrate diets from their consideration. And uh, so it's, it's a challenge, but if you, you know, as in my case, I have compiled the evidence so that when, if, when I, basically they're, they're too busy to challenge me in, in most cases. And with the residents, I try to ease them into it because the only thing I find young doctors coming into family medicine training know with regard to nutrition is they say, 
they tell all their patients to either follow the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet. Those are the two diets that are in vogue in most medical schools, it appears to me. And we get residents from all kinds of medical schools all over the country. So um, that's, uh, that's what they've learned about. And of course, the DASH diet is not just a diet. It's a lifestyle intervention with meditation and exercise and all this kind of stuff. And the, you, know, you don't know which part of that is uh, is is giving the benefit from that. And the same thing, uh, nobody can agree on what a Mediterranean diet is. And if you go to many Mediterranean countries, they eat a lot of sausage, cheese, salted fish. You know, it's not just all these olives and salads. <laughs> so uh, who knows what the Mediterranean diet really is. Uh, so that's... Uh, the answer is I'm, I'm in a small residency. We see a whole lot of patients every day, and uh, I deal with a whole lot more than just uh, the metabolic syndrome, though uh, according to the NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition uh, Estimation Survey, uh, the government, 88% uh, of Americans now have at least one marker of the uh, metabolic syndrome, and 52% of Americans are either uh, diabetic or pre-diabetic. So it's an epidemic in our country, insulin resistant. It's, it's really down to the, uh, to the sugar addiction and the way sugar has found its way into all the foods and then the highly processed carbohydrate foods contribute to it. So, uh, you know, that's what we deal with every day in our clinic, all those things. And uh, I would say that I'm, there are more and more doctors finding low carb. I'm in a group of about 200 doctors that we, uh, we communicate by email in a, a Google group, uh, and we talk about the, the latest research in low carb. And I'm also a member of the um, Association of Metabolic Healthcare Practitioners. Uh, I'm, I'm like a board, it's a new, specialty, medical specialty that's run uh, by, uh, uh, it was really started by Low Carb USA and uh, Doug, uh, I'm blanking on his last name, but uh, uh, there's a lot of the big names that put together the uh, protocols that we use for, for using low carb. And uh, so the, Low carbohydrate medicine is gaining uh, in respectability and prominence around the country, but it's, it, I'd say it's exploding with, uh, you know, the VERTA program now is available in the VA. It's a low carb program that's online, VERTA, V I R T A Health, H E A L T H dot com, VERTA Health. You can see it. And now, um, United Healthcare, which has something, they insure something like 24 million Americans for their health, has started a kind of a copycat program of Virta called Level Two. Okay. And I'm not sure what the website is for that, but we could find it and put it in. Uh, so more and more people are, you know, as in Virta published a, a paper showing that when people went on their low carb diet, uh, the uh, insurance companies could save $10,000 a year in, med in medication costs alone uh, when these people went on the low carb diet and, uh, you know, 90% uh, of them got off all their insulin and other medicines except uh, for metformin, which is very, very inexpensive. And uh, they have their A1Cs drop below uh, 6.5, which is the cutoff for diabetes. So, um, I think the insurance companies are very interested because they're beginning to realize that they can save a whole lot of money if they can get people to go on low carbohydrate diets. And I also thought that it was very interesting. Uh, one of the approaches that the level two that's sponsored by United uh, Health Insurance uh, is that they're giving their participants in that program continuous glucose monitors to use. And they, they tell them to be particularly aware of what the, the levels are an hour to two, hour or two after they eat, because that can teach them which foods that they're eating are raising their blood sugar. 
And so it's a great educational tool. I like to use it myself for in my patients if they're having trouble on their low carb diets and not getting uh, the weight loss they want or the lowering of their hemoglobin A1C number, the number that represents uh, how your blood sugars have been over the last 90 days. If they're not getting uh, enough progress on that, then I will often prescribe them a continuous glucose monitor and tell them just to take a picture of everything they're eating and uh, so that after the two weeks when they get their report, they can look at the spikes and then go back and, and uh, look at the pictures on their camera and find out what foods we're doing, we're, we're raising their sugars. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting off the carnivore track. Uh, on the carnivore track, I, I did, uh, I know that in 2020, you went over to uh, Spain at the uh, Monasterio Resort there and and gave a lecture I, I i was there the year before and i gave a, a lecture on uh, the uh, evolution of um, uh, the human diet and uh, basically the evidence that uh, that humans evolved to be primary carnivore hunters okay and uh, so uh, i had a little some a brief very brief summary of, of the evidence i gave and the the first thing was the um, Kleiber equation that showed that uh, the metabolic rate of of um, almost all animals is proportional both to its mass and to the size of each organ okay and that's a very constant so as the mass goes up you know uh, the metabolic rate and the metabolic rate equivalent equates to how many calories they need to live, okay? Basically, the amount of calories they need to live goes up. And so it turns out that in, in humans, okay, you, our, our brain is seven times the size predicted for our body mass, okay? And for instance, in the vegetarian gorillas, they have the smallest brain uh, uh, for mass of any, uh, of any primate, and of course they're pure vegetarian uh, each day to, to support that tiny brain. So uh, humans uh, uh, use actually 28% of the predicted amount of energy to, to uh, fuel their brains. And the only way we could do that because we have actually small guts, our stomach is one third the predicted size that it should be. And our colon is only half the predicted size that it should be. And the only way we, with that small stomach, small colon supporting that huge brain, the only way we can do it is to eat a high fat diet. And the only way we could get high fat diets was to, to hunt fatty meat. And so that's what we did. And uh, uh, so um, for instance, if we were, we, an active male needs about you know, 3000 calories a day uh, to support, support that brain. And if we were going to say, for instance, going to eat potatoes, that's six pounds of potatoes that we would have to eat, uh, a male would have to eat in a day, eight pounds of blackberries and uh, 12 pounds of cantaloupe <laughs> to support our brain. So that's a, a lot of food if we had to eat vegetable material. Um, the, um, so the, uh, the other evidence that I kind of touched on, and you probably heard a lot of this before, is the stable isotope studies. I think that's, it's almost a proof and not, and, and goes beyond the, the, the point of evidence. So if we look at the bone marrow of, um, of pre-agricultural humans and Neanderthals, okay, and we look at the ratio of the stable isotopes, nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15 in that, in that bone marrow, uh, we see we can see that humans were uh, top chain predators. Okay, and the way we do that is uh, both nitrogen fourteen and nitrogen fifteen are stable; they don't break down over time. So nitrogen fifteen doesn't ever convert to nitrogen fourteen. Okay. Hey, Paul, oh, let me interrupt you. Your micro your microphone volume dropped pretty dramatically. I don't know if there, if you did something to turn it down. Maybe you can turn the volume back up a little bit. Let me do that. I, I don't know why it would do that, but we'll just check it out. I'm going to just audio settings. Okay, my microphone. Here, let me move the, the microphone a little closer to me. Is that better? 
Yeah, that's definitely better. Okay, yeah. well, let, we'll do that. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, the, the, the nitrogen atoms are stable, and it turns out that uh, just like mercury builds up in, in fish as they go up the, the chain of predation, uh, so a very small fish have a very low amount of mercury, and at the fish that eat them have higher amount of mercury, and then the fish that eat those intermediate fish have really high levels of mercury. Uh, nitrogen 15 is very low in animals that eat primarily plants. And then uh, in uh, uh, the uh, animals that, that, uh, that eat animals that eat plants have more nitrogen, and the animals that eat animals that eat animals that eat plant have even more uh, nitrogen 15 uh, for every atom of nitrogen 14. So uh, that data and looking at the, the um, uh, looking at the bone marrow concentrations of those two uh, atoms in uh, pre-agricultural humans, we find out that we're right up there uh, next to the Arctic fox, which of course obviously eats no uh, no plant foods, and uh, we're uh, we're with uh, right at the level of wolves, okay, which also eat almost no plant material. Uh, so that's one way we know that that humans are born to be carnivores, which of course my website born to eat meat .com. And so if we look at uh, some of the other evidence, uh, 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 we, we look, there's one interesting study that I found where they studied two Indian tribes that lived 1500 years apart in South Carolina. And they, were, they know from the, uh, from the DNA material that they were genetically related but one of them, one of the tribes, uh, was uh, uh, one of the tribes was a hunter-gatherer society that did not raise. There was no evidence of agriculture at their site, and the other tribe was an agriculture, primarily agricultural society that raised, you know, beans and corn, and did a little bit of subsistence hunting and maybe raised a few animals. But uh, the Evident, the evidence in the bones for their health was dramatically different. The, uh, the hunter-gatherers that, uh, that were, didn't eat uh, grains uh, uh, had much less uh, iron deficiency, almost no tooth decay. Uh, their life expectancy was much longer, and, their, uh, uh, and they basically were much more healthy, much taller. So uh, we know that when humans transition to, to being uh, farmers, uh, that their height dropped by an average of four to six inches, and uh, there were other consequences. So other evidence that we were hunters is the uh, evolutionary adaptations that humans have made. And some of those are throwing. Uh, there are no other... Uh, species of primates can throw like we do. The chimpanzees will occasionally throw, but they're not very accurate, and they can't get anywhere near the velocities that we have. Uh, there are special adaptations in our sh shoulders to store the energy and then release it uh, in, in a throwing motion that other uh, primates have not evolved. Uh, we also um, evolved uh, some um, adaptations for what I call like to call persistence hunting, and uh, I, there's, there's really good videos on that, but the uh, way humans used to hunt was to basically wound the uh, animal with some sort of a throwing or maybe a, a bow and arrow type uh, weapon, and then uh, basically follow the animal in the hot sun. We would, we would hunt them in the hot sun, and our lack of hair and our increased number of sweat glands would allow us to and also our bipedalism, which meant we had to expend uh, 40 to 50, 40 to 45% less energy for the same amount of, of, of territory covered as the animal who was on four legs, uh, allowed us to just basically chase them down until they overheated in the sun because they can't keep up their, their rapid uh, flight. And our enlarged brains allowed us to track them and, and figure out where they were going. 
And of course, it also allowed us to cooperate so we could have a bunch of hunters uh, scattered all over the area to pick up the chase when we lost uh, contact with them because they were much faster than we were. It's a very interesting thing, but uh, uh, the evolutionary uh, adaptations we've had, of course, down, down pointing Nares also helped us track them. But, um, the, uh, the other things, and the other, only other thing I had in that lecture of any interest was uh, the counter arguments are saying that we uh, uh, we have the teeth of a uh, of a, veg a vegetarian or a herbivore, and that's true that uh, we haven't developed a lot of adaptations with our teeth. But the reason for that is there's very good evidence that all the way back, uh, you know, two million years ago with Homo erectus, we were also all already using fire uh, to um, to cook our meat, which means that we didn't need to have tearing, cutting teeth uh, to uh, fully chew our teeth. If, uh, uh, if you eat a steak raw, it's going to take you at least four or five times the amount of time if you, if you really chew it up uh, to, to, uh, to eat it. And uh, so we, we, by cooking our food, we gained more free time to do uh, things like, uh, you know, learning to make better weapons, learning, uh, practicing cooperation in hunting and that sort of thing. And uh, there's a great book on, uh, by William Rangham called Catching Fire, uh, that how uh, fire made us human. And it's a, it's a good read and it explains a lot of that, how the, the cooking helped us get more energy from our food with much less time in, in, uh, investment. And so uh, the other thing is that uh, the uh, uh, human molars are ridged like, uh, like the molars of wolves rather than flat like the molars of grain eating or plant eating uh, animals. So that's all I have from that lecture. And I thought I could summarize that briefly. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that work, you know, the work of Michael Richards, uh, you know, out of uh, from uh, Max Planck University, he's done several studies on, on different radioisotopes. And I know Mike Eads, Eads has talked about some of these different hunter gatherer group, hunter groups versus farmer groups and look at the bone quality. You can see a significant difference in that. Um, what So one of the, I guess one of the biggest uh, concerns that I, I continue to hear about, you know, going on a meat heavy diet is that it's going to raise your serum cholesterol level and therefore you're going to immediately drop dead of a heart attack. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that particular question? Because it does come up. Well, you know, that's probably what I get the most blowback from, uh, from my colleagues, because they're all locked into the uh, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, statin guidelines yeah. and uh, frankly uh, because the science there is frank is so muddy that uh, uh, you know I, I basically uh, just do do my own thing with my patients I don't actually argue with the residents and I when I first got there I, I tried to get the residents to think about uh, about their statin usage for, for instance uh, Okay, uh, I, one of the things I always do is tell, challenge them to bring me just one study, one single study, uh, a, a randomized controlled trial of statins where a statin showed prevention of a first heart attack or uh, increase in longevity in a woman, in, in women. Because to my knowledge, there aren't any, okay? And I, I, I tell them I'll, I'll give them a fresh, crisp $100 bill if they can bring me that study. Okay. So how can the, um, the American Card College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association recommend statins for primary prevention in women? Uh, it boggles my mind, okay? But they use uh, some convoluted, uh, what we call um, uh, uh, substitute markers, okay? And, and they use a, bu a bunch of meta-analyses and they say, well, they probably will help women, they probably, but they've never shown it, okay? And it, it, 
So if you practice evidence-based medicine and you're using uh, statins to treat uh, as primary prevention in women, to my mind, you're not practicing evidence-based medicine. So uh, I also have written a paper for my residents and I can, I can, you know, my my emails on my website. If if you want it, want that that little paperette that I wrote, and I might get published someday. There's really overwhelming evidence that the fact that statins lower LDL cholesterol is not why they decrease uh, heart disease in as secondary prevention, and they do decrease the uh, uh, incidence of heart attacks in people who have already had a heart attack. And it's the reason uh, is that they, uh, they lower uh, inflammation. They're basically anti-inflammatories. And uh, of course, inflammation is a big part of, of uh, the process of having a myocardial infarction. So, uh, but uh, there's an interesting point uh, in that uh, when uh, the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors like lisinopril, which most people are on, uh, first came out, they, they, sh they were found to be uh, very cardioprotective, okay? And, uh, the, um, and the reason is, I think, that they, they're able to lower the C-reactive protein or CRP. That's a marker of inflammation. So they're able to lower total body inflammation by up to 35%. At the highest doses. Okay. So uh, then, uh, 10 years later, when the uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, the ARBs, uh, medicines like valsartan and, uh, and the like, came along, and uh, in the studies, they showed the same blood pressure reduction. They also showed reduction of uh, CRP, but they, uh, they didn't show a cardioprotective benefit. And I believe the reason that they didn't was because statins, which at the highest dose can reduce CRP or inflammation by 45%, uh, most of the patients in the, uh, in the angiotensin receptor blocker studies were also taking a statin. So that benefit of lowering the CRP or the inflammation had already been handled by the statin. So the addition of the angiotensin receptor blocker then didn't really show much additional cardio uh, protection. So I, I think there's really good evidence that it's the inflammation and that uh, a, a carnivore or even other uh, low carbohydrate diets uh, reduces total body inflammation and you probably do not need to uh, take a statin medication. But again, the, the science, obviously all those studies haven't been done to conclusively show that. and Frankly, in, in my setting of academic medicine, to argue with them uh, would basically, I, I think that the, I actually wrote an article on my blog position called Cholesterol Benefits and Statin, uh, and uh, you said Cholesterol Benefits and Statin Adverse Effects Your Doctor May Not Have Told You About, uh, to explain you know, that statins are not perfect. And uh, so um, uh, basically, I think that the, the harm of statins in most people is fairly low. And I just, I'm trying to fight just to get people to go to do low carb. So to try to fight to get them to stop prescribing statins, I think for me, is just a distraction and it's just not worth it because it could torpedo my work of getting them to accept ketogenic diets and low carb. So that's where I'm at with that. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned like the pleiotrophic effects of the statins and they've been, you know, that's, that's certainly not a new concept that they're, they're, they're decreasing inflammation. Um, you know, when we look at all cause mortality and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I almost all the studies I've seen looking at all cause mortality, and cholesterol do not line up with the AHA guidance for heart disease. And so, you know, if you get to a certain age, you're going to like, I'm going to die of something. It might be cancer. It might be neurodegenerative disease. It might be, uh, you know, infectious disease. It might be, it might be heart disease, but I mean, you know, why don't we have, why, why isn't all cause mortality talked about more 
openly among physicians when it comes to you know what our cholesterol level might be because it seems like it doesn't line up with the with the, the heart with the cardiologist's desires i suppose well you know that's easy to answer <laughs> it's money okay um the most medical research these days is funded by either uh, pharmaceutical companies or uh, agribusiness and they want studies that support the use of their products, uh, be it uh, polyunsaturated vegetable oils or, uh, or whole wheat products or uh, um, statin medications, uh, other medications. And so uh, research that would, uh, frank, uh, research that would be negative neg would show those products in a negative light is basically doesn't receive funding because the uh, a lot of the re there is probably 20 percent of research is funded by our government through the national institutes of health and the people in positions that control who gets those funds are political appointees and the politicians that appointed those people uh, receive tremendous amounts of money from agribusiness and the pharmaceutical industry. And so most of the people that are in those positions are ex-pharmaceutical workers or agribusiness lobbyists, okay, frankly. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad situation, but it is what it is. And uh, uh, I don't know that that's gonna change anytime. Certainly, I doubt it's gonna change at all in my lifetime. So the researchers, I think, are honest and showing, showing the truth, but uh, uh, the constraints that are given on them for the kind of studies they have to do to get their studies funded are, are limited. And if they do publish studies that are very uh, contradictory to what the, statin, the message the statin makers want to get out, uh, they not only will lose statin medication funding, but there's a network, I think, where they would lose funding for any research that they wanted to do because they had offended big pharma or they had offended big agribusiness. And, they can, and not only that, but the, they, can, they can threaten uh, the schools that they, that they work for that are totally dependent on grants and funding from these organizations and say, you know, if this professor doesn't go away, you're probably not going to, nobody in your, your university is going to get very much in the way of funds from us. So, you know, that kind of thing, unfortunately, I think does happen. Yeah, unfor yeah I agree. I think that unfortunately, uh, much of the medical curriculum and, and healthcare is, is largely directed by the pharmaceutical companies. Um, and that is, I think that's becoming more and more apparent as time goes on, people are seeing this more and more. Let me ask you about, you know, because, you know, you are in there still trying to fight the fight, the good fight. What has been your like success rate with, with patients? You know, if you get the typical, I guess, you know, East Texan rolling in there with, you know, a hundred, you know, 75 pounds to lose and, you know, they're diabetic or pre-diabetic and they're hypertensive. How, you know, how, how effective are you at, 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 you know, getting them to change their lifestyle? Because that's the biggest thing. Most doctors say it's useless. It's not worth trying. No one does it anyway. Therefore, we're just kind of, you know, just hit the prescription pad and just, and, and just keep going that way. But are you finding um, increased success? And, and, and if so, do you have some sort of um, tricks to, I mean, tricks or tips or things that help you out to get people to be more successful? You know, um you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, nobody wants to change their diet. Everybody wants a pill to make it all better. Okay. And my success rate, I would rate between three and maybe three and 4% of the people that I actually, you know, I get, I give the U-turn card to pretty much everybody who has the metabolic syndrome that I see and, or that I see with residents, because I see, uh, you know, 25 to 30 patients a day uh, with the residents because certainly with the first years, I have to go in with them and see the patient. And with the second years, uh, by then, uh, 
uh, I, they have to present the case to me and I've, I've got the residents trained to give the people that have metabolic issues uh, the U-turn card so they can go to the program. And we've had in the last three years, I'd say 75 big successes that lost 50 or more pounds, got their A1 disease down significantly and turned their life around. But most people don't want to give up sugar, don't want to give up carbs. And it, it's, it's, you know, I'd, I'd like to find a way to, to, to turn that around. But uh, frankly, uh, I'd say the vast majority of people would rather have a shorter lifespan and more illness than give up those things that they, they've come to love, uh, you know, in the way of food. And I, I don't, if anybody here can tell me a magic bullet for turning that around, but uh, I don't know, it's like uh, uh, the, the good shepherd who left the flock to go find the one lost sheep, you know, I'll try to be the good shepherd and, and, and try to find those three or 4% of the patients that say, oh my gosh, I, nobody ever told me that before. You mean all I have to do is change my diet and this will all go away? And uh, those are the people that I'm here for. And, and I think uh, you know, I, I'm happy with three or four percent right now. Yeah, I think certainly um, there, there is no magic pill, as you, you describe, or magic, you know, magic bullet. Uh, but I think, you know, I think, you know, having uh, a support system and, you know, getting people to buy into this, you know, I mean, people that I consult with, you know, come to me because they're ready to make a change. But, you know, if you look at, if you talk to the man on the street, you go to the grocery store and, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I challenge anybody to go to the grocery store and not find people that are metabolically sick and ill. I mean, in, in, in many cases, you know, morbidly obese. I mean, that's, that's unfortunately the norm today. And I'm sure when you grew up, you know, you know, back when you were a kid or a young adult, that was a rarity. You didn't see 300 pound people, 400 people pound. Yeah, so, yeah, I agree. And uh, I think that the success of the programs like Virta that they're having is the intensive support that's given. Uh, for instance, with Virta, uh, they're given um, a scale and they're given a glucometer that also does ketone levels and they're given a schedule to check their weight, to check their ketones, their sugar, and all of those, the, those devices that they're given are Bluetooth to their phone so that when they do it, that data is then uploaded to their counselor and they meet with their counselor once a week to go over their numbers, to go over how they're, what, how they're eating, and uh, they're given support. And they also have 24 seven access to a diet coach and to a doctor. So the diet coach, if they feel that there's an adjustment of their medication that's needed, can refer them over to the doctor who can do that. And so, you know, that's the ideal setting. I, of course, uh, I, I work in a, a community health, well, it's a, uh, it's a county health center that's funded by the county and we serve patients without insurance, patients who are uh, homeless, undocumented. So that's our patient level. And a lot of those people are not as functional as you know, middle class people with a job. So they're even, you know, less likely to be able to engage in a, uh, a low carb diet uh, than other folks are less interested. A lot of them have substance abuse issues. So, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that keeps my success rate at three to 4%. <laughs> and uh, of course I can't offer Bluetooth equipment to my patients or continuous glucose monitors to many of them because they don't have the funds to buy them and no insurance. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a huge point that, you know, often, you know, the, 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 the most socioeconomically, you know, downtrodden, the harder it is. I mean, you know, the food, the, the food that's cheap is the food that, you know, contributes to all this stuff. And it's, it's really a tough one to get out of. And then again, you have to have people that are you know, willing to do that. And like you said, I've, I've literally amputated people's legs for diabetic complications and they still don't want to give up the, 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 the Coca-Cola and the, you know, the, the, the pies and the cookies. I mean, they're just, they're, they're literally um, like almost like heroin addicts. I mean, they can't give it up, won't give it up. And it requires, you know, I mean, for some people it's, I don't know, there's another, how much support you can give them, but, you know, within this community, uh, we do the similar similar things. We have lots of people that, you know, we have, you know, basically almost a 
community support and we're going we're going in a way where we're going to be having a lot of the things you'd mentioned that that uh, verta has as an advantage and i think the more people that do this the, the you know because there's there's an unlimited supply of you know obese diabetics in this country unfortunately i mean I, you know i think it, you know it's going to take a long time to reach all those people just to just you know uh, even if you, even if they were all motivated, and you mentioned, but many of them are not. But I mean, over time, I think people are going to look at it and say, "I, I kind of would prefer to have all my toes and legs as I go forward in life, and, and you know, be able to see and not become blind and those types of things." So hopefully, that that message will get out there. Um, Paul, unfortunately, I'm running out of time. I've got a, you know, we usually do this for an hour. So remind us again of your social media. Uh, and any, any other uh, information you want to make sure people have access to? Well, you know, um, one thing, if anybody has questions or uh, wants to contact me, a, a good way to reach me is just to write, send an email to barn to eat meat at gmail.com. And of course, my website is barn to eat meat at uh, dot com. So that's the easy way to get a hold of me. I don't do a lot of social media anymore because I spend so much time researching and writing articles and teaching. And of course, the, I, I work Monday through Friday, eight to five. And then in the evenings, I have two or three hours of reviewing resident clinic notes, uh, labs that they, that they ordered, x-rays they ordered, consults they ordered. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really a, a busy guy right now. And, uh, but I never have, uh, I always have enough time to answer the emails that I get, especially from people who have, you know, questions about my positions on things. And uh, see, uh, I I do have a bunch of lectures uh, on um, on my YouTube site that I've given to the residents, uh, and that's just Paul Mabry. If you just search Paul Mabry, my my YouTube site should come up, and uh, then. Uh, uh, I, there's the U-turn program that I use to teach my residents how to eat low carb, where I do uh, strongly advocate the, the what I call the carnivore option, okay? And that's at u-turn, T-U-R-N dot us, and there's no ads on it, nothing to buy. It's free for anybody who wants to use that program. And uh, that's it, and I've really enjoyed talking to you guys in, in a, a friendly audience for a change. <laughs> and... Uh, so, uh, and I'm a big fan of Sean Baker and, and his carnivore uh, diet plan. And I think it's a great one. And uh, I, I wish you all the best of luck. Well, Paul, thank you for that and appreciate it. Let's, let's, uh, let's hook up again down the road here as you continue to advance and, and let's, let's kind of maybe, maybe in six months or so see how you're up to. And uh, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. You know, like I said, the more, it's a lonely road sometimes and it's, it's tough. And, you know, like I said, it's fine. It's good to find other people that understand and have looked at the literature and, 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 and more importantly, looked at the results people are getting. I mean, you, you know, it's, 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 you know, the, the nice thing we just had Harvard produce a little study, even though it's not, you know, it's not an intervention randomized control trial, but it does show uh, that there are people that are getting very healthy doing this stuff. And so it's raising some eyebrows and making some questions being asked and, you know, I, I just think that's that's part of part of the deal, and we just got to keep keep pushing. So, thank thank you very much. I tell you what, the next time we get together, uh, I'll talk to you about uh, the, um, uh, the the lecture I gave to the low carb all stars on polycystic ovarian syndrome, and also the the other lecture I gave at uh, the the uh, Phil Escott's group uh, in Monasterio Perfect. on yeah. uh, plant anti the anti nutrients in plants that can make us sick. Very good. That sounds great. Let's 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 set that up for another round too. All right, Paul. Take care, everybody. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Join Rivero.health for a 30-day free trial to get access to live QA with VIP guests, social community meetings, member discounts, low-carb healthcare providers list, forum, workouts, monthly challenges, early access to podcasts, recipes, carnivore diet guide, fasting guide, shred guide, and much more. 